Well, good morning, everyone. Um, I have had the honor to serve for the past two years um, as chair of Governor Deal's Commission on Child Welfare Reform chair. So that has been um, an incredible journey. Um, Judge Peggy Walker was also a part of that with me, but have learned much over the past two years about the challenges facing our children in this state, particularly around um, mental health and how the science of brain development and toxic stress has impacted them. So we wanted to talk a little bit today about brain science, how that impacts the work that you all do, and hear from some of the experts in the field who know the most about this. So sitting immediately next to me is Judge Peggy Walker, and she is followed by Commissioner Brenda Fitzgerald from the Department of Public Health. And finally, we have Dr. Jordan Greenbaum from Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. And Peggy, I'm going to start with you and let you share a little bit about your specific work within your respective field, and we'll go around the table. I've had the opportunity to serve as a zero to three fellow and then bring back that information to the state. I do a lot of teaching of juvenile court judges, court appointed special advocates, foster parents. We want to make sure that we are serving our infants and toddlers in the best way that we can. Great. And I am Dr. Brenda Fitzgerald, and I'm the Commissioner of the Georgia Department of Public Health. Uh, there are two things that I do. One, we oversee the Babies Can't Wait, the Children's First, several services that are available for families. And secondly, we have a um, initiative that is about early brain development uh, called the Brain Trust for Babies. And I'm Jordan Greenbaum. I'm a child abuse physician at the Stephanie Blank Center for Safe and Healthy Children at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. I have a real interest in uh, child maltreatment and its impact on children, their brain development, their subsequent um, behavior and growth and development uh, is very interesting to me. So I'm happy to be here. Thanks. Well, Dr. Greenbaum, we are actually going to start with you. Several years ago, the American Academy of Pediatrics finally recognized in an official way that toxic stress is a critical issue that even pediatricians should be addressing. Can you explain to the audience a little bit about what toxic stress is and how that compares to traumatic stress? Because we may use both of those phrases today. Such a great question. So traumatic stress really refers to the physical and the emotional reaction a person has, child or adult, when they uh, perceive danger to themselves or someone close to them. Uh, so any type of, type of trauma can lead to traumatic stress. And that can be handled by the child in a number of different ways. So all of us are going to have some sort of trauma during our lives, and it may uh, be tolerable trauma if we have support from other people, if we understand, uh, can see it in a big picture way. Adults are better able to, to uh, adapt to it. We can overcome that challenge. But if the trauma is um, uncontrolled, unpredictable, or unsupported by other people, the child has no one around them to help them process what happened, then it becomes toxic stress. So traumatic stress is not necessarily toxic. It can be if they don't have the support. So we could say safely then that uh, traumatic stress tends to be more of maybe a one-time, or could be a one-time incident, whereas toxic tends to be prolonged and has more of a long-term impact? Traumatic stress can be multi, uh, multi, multiple events and can be chronic. So complex trauma can, be, can trigger traumatic stress as well. So it can really vary. It can be a single event or it can be lots of events. Okay. Well, now that we have kind of that baseline understanding of toxic and traumatic stress, Judge Walker, I'm curious to know how you see this level of stress manifesting itself in your courtroom with the children and the families. Well, the thing that we know is that this type of stress, particularly when it's complex trauma, is going to impact their physical growth, but it's also going to affect their language development. And children that don't have language have difficulties expressing themselves, and the way that we see the uh, trauma manifest is in their behavior. So when children don't develop language like other children, behavior becomes their language. And so when you say behavior becomes their language, this can be seen even at a young age, correct? I mean, little, yes. little kids. Yes, particularly when you have children that can't self-regulate. That tells you that they are not getting the feedback, they're not getting the attention, they're not getting the redirection. So if you have children that are having difficulty, perhaps in their foster care placement, 
they're having difficulty in daycare, they're having difficulty in pre-K, that's certainly an indicator that you need to be asking the questions of where the behavior comes from. A lot of the work that we've done has been focusing on trying to change behavior without understanding where it comes from, and that's the mistake we've made and why we've not made progress because of the way we are attempting to address the behaviors. So would it be safe to say that sometimes these children are, are labeled as, you know, bad kids or their behavioral issue kids, um, and they tend to get lumped into one category versus looking beneath the surface? One of the things, I'll give you an example. One of the things that we've seen is around visitation. You may have children start to act out before the visitation or after the visitation, and then you will have a request to stop the visitation. But what we're not really understanding is that this is grief and loss, and the acting out is their way of saying that they miss their family. And if we misinterpret that, then we're actually doing more harm. That's fascinating. Um, well, one of the things that I think we also need to talk about in, in this session, and Dr. Fitzgerald, I know you know a lot about this and maybe you could give us kind of the elevator speech version. What is it about these first five years of life, this birth to five stage, that is so critical? What is, what's going on that we need to pay attention to? There's basic biology going on. There is a tremendous spurt, uh, spurt of growth in that very first part of life. Uh, as a matter of fact, the last month of pregnancy, there is a increase in the brain size by one third. We learned that, that the normal progression and development of the brain is so important when we were looking at elective deliveries at 39 weeks. We did matching of birth records, babies born at 37 weeks of age and 39 weeks of age. And at the third grade, on their standardized test scores, you could see a difference in their ability to perform on both reading and arithmetic. So there's a huge importance of that early brain. If you look at the brain science that's, uh, that's developed, there is a critical time for language development that is in that first year of life, not even the first five years of life, the first year of life. And you can measure the number of uh, words that a child has been exposed to, the number of words that a child knows at 18 months of age, and that is predictive for not only their ability to read at third grade, but then their ability to graduate from high school and basically their ability to function in life. At 18 months of age, we can see a difference. So from a, from a brain development standpoint, what, what is actually going on? I know some of us in the field have heard about serve and return mm -hmm. process. Can you talk about what that is and why that's so important and kind of what, what physically is going on in the brain? Absolutely. The brain is a, is a work in progress. Uh, they're actually language. You talked about language. When a child is exposed to language, that stimulates neuron development in their brain. You can actually see the development of neurons. But here's the important part. At that first stage, there are stimulations of those neurons about 700 times a second. And I think is, we've got a slide up that's showing 700 little stars yes. to, to <laughs> highlight how many of those are happening each per second. second. Each second. And then when you get the stimulation, that means that there are, these neurologic paths are available for future use. If you don't get repeated stimulations of the neurons, you get something called pruning, which means that that, neuro, that neuron basically goes away and is no longer available. So as Judge Walker was talking about, if you have language development and stimulation of that brain tissue, you have something with which to build. If there is an interruption of that process or there's not the stimulation to begin with, you don't have those neurons. So the serve and return, the stimulation is really from the adult to the child. It, it is hearing many, many words, but it's not just hearing a television. The serve and return means the interaction between the mother and the child. Um, and we, there is in the resources uh, a video called the Still Face Experiment, and it very brilliantly, I think, demonstrates that very primitive response uh, and how important that is for a child to have those early, early stimulations. 
So what is the Department of Public Health doing to address these issues? Talk a little more specifically about some of your programs. Okay. We are, we are certain that early brain development is the missing piece that we really need to concentrate on as a state. So we have brought together a public-private partnership called the Brain Trust for Babies, and we our goal is to give people specific information about, one, the importance of that early brain development, but also the needed extra stimulations that you have for particular groups of children. And I know we're gonna be talking about toxic stress a little bit later, so there's specific things that need to be done. Um, so our goal is we've started, for example, in WIC, Women's and Infants and Children's um, Nutrition Program. Every single WIC nutritionist has been trained to be a language nutritionist as well as a food nutritionist because we believe that, this, that the parent-child needs to be surrounded in the supportive group that makes sure that information goes to parents and that parents know how to do it. Um, at of uh, the uh, Atlanta Speech School on the Cox campus. There is already a video that has been created for early child care workers so they can go on and learn about it and how to do it. And there's a video for foster parents so they can understand basic brain, brain biology and how to stimulate babies' brains. Now, is the Cox campus available to anyone who wants to go on and see that? Yes, it is. The Cox campus is free. That's great. And can you talk a little bit about Talk With Me Baby, too? Yes. Um, the, um, the, the notion of Talk With Me Baby is that if you have multiple people telling a parent how to talk with their baby, the serve and return, the emotional input of that conversation that's important for brain development, that parents can learn this and they can empower their parents to, and they can empower uh, they will be empowered, rather, to give their children an increased um, opportunity to have brain development. We have, we believe that we can do that by having multiple sources. So like I said, we have trained all uh, the WIC nurses in this. We have a video for foster parents, soon to be ready for all DFACS workers. We have for early child care people already developed. Um, and we are working with um, we are working with Grady to make Grady a Talk With Me Baby Hospital so that doctors, nurses, nutritionists, child care workers, DFACS workers, the judge, the judicial system, everyone that it comes in contact with a child helps enable that parent to encourage the life, the development of that child's brain. Well, I think one of the things that we, we often think is that this should come just naturally, right? It should just be instinctive to know how to be a great parent. That's, that's not the case. And I know, Judge Walker, you had a great example of a mother you saw in your courtroom that really highlights the Talk With Me baby, and would love for you to share that. Yes, my aha moment was when I had a young teen mother come into the courtroom with her baby. And I really want to encourage our caseworkers to pick up babies and talk to babies and pay attention to their body, pay attention to their faces, because you learn a lot from having that baby in your arms. So one of the things I like to do is hold the baby. So she, of course, is very proud of her baby. She's very excited for me to see the baby. And I ask her to bring the baby up and I hold the baby. And the baby's at the age where she's just beginning to make sounds. And it's really a good time to talk to the baby. So I'm doing the, the contact, but I turn the baby around to face the mother because I want to see the interaction between the mother and the baby. So I say, talk to your baby. And this 15-year-old mom that I've known most of her life doesn't react. So I say again, talk to your baby and no response. And finally I say, what's up? I don't understand. And with tears in her eyes, she says to me, I don't know how. So I turn the baby around and I talk to the baby and I get the baby smiling and cooing and doing the reciprocal sounds. And I said, that's what I want you to do for your baby. But this time when I hand the baby back to her, I've got tears in my eyes because I realize she's been raised by a parent that is alcoholic. And what we see with substance abusing parents is they're physically present, but they're not emotionally present. And they don't do that nurturing piece. She hadn't been nurtured and we had to teach her. She's a great parent and we're very fortunate that we recognized that she needed that. But when she said those words, I don't know how. 
that is, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Ahead, I just was. You're absolutely right, and that is the perfect illustration, and it it, it illustrates the work that Hart and Reesley did. These were researchers that were looking at babies who succeeded and babies who did not succeed, and by the time the end of the third year of life, babies who succeed are hearing 30 million more words. And you're right. If her mother didn't didn't teach her by that normal interaction, then she will not be able to teach her child unless we teach her. I think it's also important for parents, um, caregivers, anybody who's working with young children to understand that the quality of those 30 million words is also important. Um, very often, many children in very stressed households tend to hear negative words, words that shut down communication. Yes. Um, no, stop, sit down, be quiet. Um, and I think words that, that um, encourage a child to explore the world around them, to interact with another human being, are important. But the good news is, is words don't cost our families anything. Right. This isn't something you have to go out and buy. Um, it is all about just that human connection and, and interaction. And I think that um, one of the things that you just touched on, um, because her mother had been an alcoholic, is you know very often what we hear about, particularly through the media, are very horrific examples of physical abuse. But the fact of the matter is, is that most of our children are entering into this system because of neglect. And um, Dr. Fitch, uh, Dr. Greenbaum, I would love for you to talk for a moment about why neglect is so particularly traumatic to a child. What, what is, we think of it as benign, yeah. but what's really going on? I think neglect is, is really um, largely misunderstood. There are countless studies that have been done over the last 40 years looking at long-term outcomes of children who have been neglected versus those who have been physically or sexually abused. And almost universally with these studies, the children who report neglect have worse long-term outcomes across many domains, physical development, uh, language, academics, social, et cetera. Um, and I think a lot of that uh, stems from early on in, in a, a lack of real interaction with a parent and a caregiver and poor attachment. Uh, a lot of kids who have been neglected may not ever get the, the vocabulary to describe how they feel. And so they can't describe their emotions and they can't interact with the caregiver in a way that's kind of the give and take that you would expect with a, with a normal attachment as the child gets older to be able to negotiate uh, with the, the caregiver, the differences they may see. They can't do that because they don't have the vocabulary to do that uh, and can't describe their emotions. And that makes it very, very difficult for them to um, communicate with other people. Well, so let's talk for a second about primary attachment and, and really what that is because it's, in many ways, it's the, the most fundamental beginning of a, of a human relationship that a child will have. It, it has a lot to do with trust and, and love and, and I think it's really un, important for everyone who's out there working with young children to know what primary attachment is and why that's so critical. Well, primary attachment occurs very early in life and starts sort of the second half the first year and then extends for the first few years. And basically what it, what it involves is this first initial relationship with the caregiver, often the parent, but not necessarily. And this whole relationship that the child is uh, forming with this person is fundamentally designing in their brain, they're laying down all the circuits, uh, to to give a blueprint of the way they are going to interact with relationships throughout their life. Uh, and the interaction between, let's say, the mother, the father, and the child um, can be very nurturing, uh, in which case all the circuits in the brain are laying down uh, circuits that, that tell the child, that, that communicate to the child, I am a valuable, uh, there is a safe world out there, people in the world care about me, there's a parent that is dependable uh, and wants to help me and will respond to my needs. Uh, because of this nurturing, uh, the, the parent is uh, alert to the cues of the child and responds well and is accessible. Um, and that is all forming uh, circuits in the brain that are uh, forming this relationship that says to the child, the view of the world is safe, uh, the caregivers out there care about me, and I'm a worthwhile person. And that's a very important view of the world and view of themselves and view of other people. And that's essentially the uh, 
um, the foundation of primary attachment. Now, I, I'd like to use an example, if that's okay. Yeah. So imagine a very uh, a nurturing parent, and they have a one child, and so uh, the child is crying at uh, three months or so. And every time they cry, uh, the parent is there to help them and nurtures them and soothes them and helps helps the child learn to soothe themselves uh, and responds to their wet diapers and their, uh, and, and their uh, hunger and talks to them a lot. That child's building a very solid uh, relationship and attachment with that person uh, and their view of the world is that it's a very safe place and this person is a safe, uh, dependable person. Now contrast that with the same three-month-old who may be, uh, whose parents may be uh, addicted to prescription drugs. So that child spends all day uh, in the crib, completely ignored in a dark room. Uh, he can cry and cry and cry and there's no response by the parent. Uh, and so that child is laying down circuits in their brain that says uh, the world is not a safe place, the world doesn't care about me, I'm not worthwhile, um, I cannot count on these caregivers to respond to me, uh, and uh, it's a very dangerous world out there. Very different form of attachment. Judge Walker, do you want to talk a little bit about primary attachment issues you see in your courtroom? Yes, we have to be very mindful that every time we're moving children, we're doing harm. That's the reason that we're really working toward doing a very active, intense family preservation, family support, because if we can serve infants and toddlers in their home and not disrupt that primary relationship, then we're not doing the harm of removal. We have to be very focused and make certain that when we are disrupting children's attachments that we are giving them the opportunity to form healthy, <coughs> appropriate attachments. Moving your children is very, very damaging to them. There is nothing more important in the life of that child than that first primary nurturing relationship. And we need to support it. We need to encourage it. If it's not there, we need to establish it. We're taught that we really want that relationship in place by the first year of that child's life, but we want it to happen within a year of our intervention. That's the reason that our track is so fast in the juvenile court. That's why our permanency hearing are at nine months. Have the changes taken place? We want to make sure we're getting children home quickly. But I do think it's important also to know that for a child who has a parent who has become unfit and is no longer capable of safely caring for that child, that it is possible to form primary attachment with a foster parent or another caregiver, maybe it's a grandparent. It's not that it can't happen. I don't know if, um, if you'd like to talk about that at all. Well, you're absolutely right. The, interesting, the most interesting thing I've seen about that is a look at brain scans of children at eight years of age. Um, when you do a brain scan for a child's basic uh, ability to think and the brain working, it's, a, it's colorful. It's, it's orange and it's red and it's huge and there's all this stuff going on. Um, and when that has not happened, when the, that child has not been stimulated by language, it is, it is dark, it is blue and gray and, and there's a real contrast that you can electronically see, physically see from that child's brain. The most fascinating thing is if you take a child who has been had normal loving relationships, it's red and yellow and bright, and you look at a child in an institution, the kind you talk about that's been ignored, and that is almost, I mean, it's grim. It's dark and blue and gray. If you have a child who is in a stressful situation that is taken out and put in foster care, a loving situation, by two years of age, that baby's brain scan at eight years of age is bright and orange and yellow and good. If it is after two years of age and the baby stays longer than two years, that brain scan is as if that child had been institutionalized his entire life. It is gray and dark and dull. So we can physically, biologically see the impact of leaving a child in a stressful situation and this also demonstrates like you were talking about the positive aspect of getting that child in a loving supportive foster home. What that really means for us is concurrent planning. We have to have plan A of reunification but in case something happens and that parent is not available we have to work at the very beginning on what the alternative plan is going to be. If you have both people actively involved in that child's life 
supporting that child and having attachments, then we're going to get to those healthy outcomes. But the bottom line that I'm hearing is we do have a narrow window yes. for a child who's in a toxic stress situation. So for folks who are working with infants and toddlers, our case managers out there, what should they be looking for when they're visiting a family? What are the good signs and what are the not so good signs that should throw up some red flags? Well, for me, I want to see how they attend to the child when the child's stressed. The child is uh, trying to engage the caregiver, and if the caregiver just ignores the child, then I'm concerned. You also want to look at things like the child's body tone. If you pick up a child and that child is rigid, that is a concern. We see that when children have had prenatal exposure to drugs. But we also see situations where they don't seem to have any strength in their body, any tone in their body. And that also tells us that there are problems where we need to be looking at the motor skills. We can look at their faces for symmetry. Uh, any of those things will tell us that we've got problems that we need to address. So it's very important to do observation of the child's physical uh, body and actions, but it's also very important to observe the nature of the relationship. What we're looking for is warmth. What we're looking for is nurturing. What we're looking for is giving that child positive feedback. So an infant that wouldn't look you in the eye might be a big red flag. That's a huge red flag. When you, uh, children are fascinated by faces, they should focus on your face, they should engage, and you can see the light in their eyes. When a child's eyes are dull, that tells you that they've just zoned out, they're not getting what they need. So the other thing that is um, problematic for this age group is they don't have the language skills to tell us if anything bad is going on. So, Dr. Greenbaum, I know that you see, unfortunately, a lot of, of little children who've been abused. Very often, we will hear the, the, whoever the caregiver was say that the child had an accident. Mm -hmm. But I think there are specific things that can be looked for because they don't fall into the normal pattern of how an infant or a toddler might injure themselves. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about what we should be looking for in terms of physical signs? I think it's a good point. In uh, many cases, if a child has been physically abused, is that what you're referring to? Mm -hmm. They have uh, injuries in places that are usually protected, not uh, in areas that are typically exposed to accidental trauma. So an active three-year-old is going to have bruises up and down their shins and their knees and probably on their forehead. Uh, but they don't tend to bruise on their torso or the inner thighs or their neck or the soft part of their cheeks. Uh, and so when you see those injuries in, in protected places, it's time to ask questions. It's not necessarily that the child's been abused, but it's time to ask questions. The other big red physical flag is when you see any type of bruising in a baby that's not yet pulling to stand and cruising. They're not mobile. They really shouldn't have bruises unless there's a good history of a fall or something. And so we need to ask questions. So the, the other part of this um, is that we do, unfortunately, see lots of children who have had just absolute nightmares of a childhood. They've not only faced neglect, but some of them have even faced, uh, faced abuse simultaneously. And we know that these kids, based on everything we know about brain development, are going to have severe challenges. But I think it's also really important to remember that these children still have the potential yes. to yes, have exactly. a healthy life. Exactly. Yes. So the question is, you know, how do we ensure that these kids do have a healthy life? What are the interventions? What do we need to be doing? I know that the brain still has plasticity. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you want to start us off by talking about that, but, yeah. but what, what is happening? I think that is the absolutely crucial thing to remember is that this window of opportunity is never slammed shut. So while it's much easier to build attachments and develop language early on, it's not like you can't make changes later. We can learn Chinese when we're older. Uh, I could learn Chinese if I tried hard enough. It'd take me six years. But uh, it, a, a three-year-old can do it much easier. Um, so I think that's a really important point, that there is uh, the ability to change and lay down new circuits and uh, uh, change our, our behavior and our beliefs about ourselves uh, through therapy. Uh, there are several different types of therapy that are very uh, strongly supported in uh, rigorous scientific research that are uh, that are geared towards helping parents and children uh, develop a more nurturing relationship. Uh, and uh, for older kids or uh, it, it, other types of therapy, help them overcome trauma and process that traumatic, toxic stress to make it more tolerable. 
Judge Walker, I know there's there's some specific services you see in your courtroom that are very effective with this. I'm very excited that we are beginning to address infant mental health because when you strengthen the relationship between the parent and the child, you are helping that child's brain develop safely, appropriately, healthy, and what we're looking at is child-parent psychotherapy. That tells us very quickly. The therapist is working one-on-one -on -one with the caregiver and the child. If the caregiver is not able to learn from that instruction, then we know that we've got capacity issues and we need to be looking at what is going to be the alternate plan for this child if the parent simply lacks capacity to be able to engage that child and keep that child safe. We also know that the parent-child interaction therapy is an effective tool and we know that using play therapy with children, particularly when it's trauma focused, will help them play out the things that they've seen to be able to reframe it, to be able to recover from the trauma that they've experienced. But it's very important for us to understand that children under the age of seven must have mental health services. And Dr. Fitzgerald, what are some of the things that within your department you're doing, if you've got a mom coming in who maybe is been a little behind and there have been some issues. What can you do uh, within your department to help her get back on track? Well, the, the easy thing, of course, is to teach her to have those loving interactions that lead to language development, and we are very actively working on that. We also, sometimes what those parents need, though, is a little bit more, or what foster parents may need, is a, is a more professional approach to that. Um, so there's something called Parent to Parent of Georgia, and there's an 800 number uh, that we can refer, that a parent can go to and get the individual resources for those, uh, for those therapists in the area that do that. Uh, public health has monies for this. Uh, we have monies for um, that are come down, most of it is federal money, but we have monies available for Babies Can't Wait, uh, for Children's Health Care Services, um, so that, that there is money to pay for those kind of services, and there's a referral way that you can get them and find them in your area. Now, I also imagine that for um, many of these children, that part of the issue um, is that mom or dad or whoever the caregiver is may also have some mental health or yes, substance yes. abuse issues of yes. their own that they're contending with. Yes. So what do we do in, in that case? Well, in the court system, we're going to focus both on the needs of the child as well as the needs of the parent. And we're going to work with them separately, but we're also going to work on, with them together. One of the things that we like to do is to do parenting instruction in the home. When we've gotten to the point where we've got the parents stable because they have done their substance abuse treatment, they've now reached a point of aftercare, they are looking at reunification, they're spending more time with their child, then we actually have the parenting instruction occur in the home <coughs> so that they can get feedback in real time and with real examples of the things they're doing to make sure that what they do with their children is appropriate and effective. And it is a modeling type of uh, coaching that occurs and it works very very well. We also find that our foster parents can be a tool and an asset to these parents because they serve as mentors and they can see things that are lacking and they can coach and encourage the parents to do what they need to do. Dr. Fitzgerald, did you want to add anything? To yeah, I was thinking the, the other thing we're really thinking of too, uh, Georgia has made a real change in our, in our approach to neonatal abstinence syndrome. Um, and we are seeing in public health an increased incidence of babies born who are uh, who uh, who have withdrawal symptoms, um, and this has now become a reportable disease. Um, and the the plan is to when we identify those parents, the notion is that if that child is born with narcotics on board, we know that that mother has issues and will continue to have issues so our we are using that as an opportunity to funnel very acute very directed services at that mother great so dr greenbaum um, for a child who has had fetal alcohol syndrome mm -hmm. um, and the damage has occurred in utero how does that look different from a child who has suffered maybe from severe neglect because i think sometimes 
one may be mistaken for mm -hmm. the other. And do the protocols change in how you address a child with fetal alcohol syndrome? Well, I think with the, the child with fetal alcohol syndrome may have actual structural defects in the brain that they're born with, and this is not something that's related to uh, postnatal environment. Um, I think that the treatment in es essentially would be in some ways similar, be sort of geared towards their signs and symptoms and what they need. So whether they are developmentally delayed because of neglect or developmentally delayed because of uh, fetal alcohol syndrome, you'd still want to get some um, uh, extra uh, help and support. Uh, for special education, for example. Um, so I think it really depends on the severity and the types of signs and symptoms that the child is, is showing. I do know that one of the risk factors very often for children being um, uh, physically abused can be if they have a severe medical condition. Yeah. Those children are, are particularly vulnerable because they are so challenging to a parent. Mm -hmm. what, what kind of resources are out there for parents who have a child who's born with a, you know, whatever issue it may be. Um, do you want to talk about that? Because actually Babies Camp, wait. And yes, Babies Camp. Again, that goes to my department. Right now, uh, the, the 800 number, it's 800-229-2038 uh, is their best resource. Uh, but your local health department really has options. Um, we are developing now, it will be ready within about six months, fully operational throughout the state is the plan. Um, we have a, we'll have one number that can be called so that you can access all the available resources in your community. Uh, because our experience with public health, we have three different things. We have Babies Can't Wait, uh, Children's Medical Services, um, and, and, and Children's First. So those come from different funding sources and it's sometimes difficult for a foster parent or a parent or the, or the judicial <laughs> system or the court to figure out where that baby fits. Uh, if you call your local uh, health department, there is a coordinator who can direct you to the right services and uh, soon there will be an 800 number that will direct you to the right services no matter where you call from. Great. To answer your question, what we do in the court system is we make certain the referral has been made to Children's First because what we're really looking at is having someone assigned from Children's Medical Services to be that medical care manager. A lot of our parents simply don't understand the nature and extent of their child's disability, so they really need encouragement about keeping all those appointments. They need to understand how the services support and help their child, and then they need someone that can help them break down barriers. There are times when we have language barriers, but there's also times when the, our, there are problems with transportation, and our parents simply do not understand that the appointments are vital to that child's well-being. So we just have to stress that they have to follow through with the services available. And the one thing that reminds me that I should add is each of those programs that's in public health has a care coordinator that comes with it. So it, it's not just an insurance company or an insurance uh, an amount of money that say, here, here's your doctor, go to them. It's really care coordination and that happens at public health and, and that happens for all of those services. So the, the other issue, um, and it's somewhat related to this, it's because parents often don't understand what's happening um, developmentally, mm -hmm. what are the appropriate stages. And we see a lot of kids um, who've been uh, physically um, abused as a form of punishment. For, maybe it's for um, wetting their pants or whatever that may be. How important is it to be talking to these families about kind of age milestones and, and appropriate behaviors. Um, you're, you're, you're nodding a lot, Dr. Kinnebaum, <laughs> yeah. so I take think this one. Absolutely critical. Um, one of the things that I noticed over the years is when I evaluate infants who are very young and are being evaluated for potential uh, physical abuse, parent after parent after parent will say, my baby's spoiled. I, people tell me I spoil my baby because I pick them up. Uh, and I don't, I don't want a spoiler, so I, I, I lay her down. Uh, or I, it, she's, it, the uh, boyfriend, for example, might be very angry because the child doesn't stop crying when he wants to sleep in. So they're totally unrealistic expectations uh, of the child because they don't understand the developmental process and what the milestones are. And so I think helping um, make expectations more realistic for parents can really uh, limit their stress because they're not expecting things to be perfect. They realize, well, the child's not screaming at me because they want to get under my skin. They're screaming because that's what you do when you're 12, two months old. Um, so I think absolutely. 
And the home visiting programs are, are very helpful, and that's another resource that public health has. The ability, or and I'm sure from the courts too, the ability for somebody to go in and to physically say, that activity, here's how you can deal with that. So you increase parental capacity. So for the folks out in the audience listening, who has access to the home visitation? Who can they assign to that program? Can anybody partake in it, or is it to a specific population? It's to a specific population because it's, it is based on the, it's a payer of last resort. Um, so if there are, if there are, if there's insurance coverage uh, for those kind of services, then that will be sought first. Uh, but again, that's a payer source issue. The best thing to do is simply go to public health and, and, and they can direct you to the correct services or the services that are available for you. So, Judge Walker, if you're getting um, someone in who's pregnant um, and, and is a first-time mom and you've got probably a lot of suspicion that maybe she, she doesn't know a whole lot about appropriate parenting skills, what can the courts do for a young woman like that? Well, we'll certainly we want to start by making sure that that pregnancy is not stressful. We know that for the baby's brain development that a stressful pregnancy in and of itself will cause that child to have problems. So we want to make sure we're addressing issues like substance abuse, we want to make sure that we're addressing issues like domestic violence because we want to give that child the best start. Nutrition is an important piece that we always talk about with our young mothers, but the part that we want to be very attentive to is that they follow through with their prenatal care and that they are not doing anything that's going to endanger that child. We really have to stay after our young people to not smoke because that, again, is something that is not good for the baby. Uh, but we have really good engagement, and I think one of the most important things for caseworkers to know, foster parents to know, that one of the skills that everyone needs is to be able to engage someone and get them to want to do the work that we are offering for them to get the outcomes that we want for the children. Uh, the, when the, once a child's born, then we want to begin the parenting instruction and make sure that that relationship is safe and that it's very nurturing. That, that reminded me, sort of an aside, um, the, the demonstration that that kind of supportive pregnancy works has been the, it's called centering pregnancy. Uh, an example of it was done in Albany and what it, at that point, it was the public health, it was a public-private relationship between public health and between private providers. So in that community in Albany, the uh, prematurity rate for black um, patients was, a, was um, 12%. Um, the prematurity rate, I'm sorry, 17%. Prematurity rate for white patients was 11%. With the centering pregnancy, which is basically a supportive structure around that pregnancy, the, the prenatal visits are an hour long. During that time, you talk about stress. You have peers around you, so there's peer support. It went down to like 5.6 for everybody. Dramatic. Another sample of that was like in DeKalb County, uh, a program that they called MORE. And it really was, it was um, a group of people, uh, Miss Cassie Bennett is in charge of it now, who said, what we're going to do is we're going to be there for these young mothers. They also saw a dramatic reduction in prematurity rates because prematurity rates are influenced by the stressful pregnancy. But if you put the supportive system around that, you can ameliorate that. Isn't that interesting? We're, we're all learning new things today. <laughs> well, one of the other things that I think um, is really important to talk about is how these children will show up within um, the school system, uh, whether it's a, a pre-K setting or whether it's when they're a little bit older, but also when they have that foster placement mm -hmm. because it affects their ability to have um, normal social relationships. And I know we've got a slide that we can put up that is all these funny little faces. Um, but I didn't know, Dr. Greenbaum, if you could talk a little bit, um, because this is actually a slide we stole from, from one of your presentations, <laughs> if you could talk a little bit about kids who've been in these high stress environments, why they're having difficulty, what is it that's going on in that interaction they have with another human. Well, I think that um, 
a lot of the behaviors that we see uh, in response to traumatic stress are um, they serve a function. I think we always have to remember that a behavior serves a function, and so we need to figure out what that function is. And many behaviors that children will um, express uh, reflect things like a need to get a, uh, somebody's attention, or a need to engage, or a need to protect themselves, or a need to reduce danger. Um, and uh, shape the world around them. So they may need something from the environment and they're, the only way they've ever been able to do that in a very hostile, dangerous environment is to act out or be aggressive or be withdrawn or being clinging. Uh, quote, problem behaviors that we see uh, that are actually very functional for the child uh, and it really helps uh, us to be able to step back and say, okay, this is the child's behavior. What, is, what purpose is that serving? Um, one of the things that's very difficult, I think, for a lot of kids who have been uh, abused or neglected is in many uh, cases, uh, they are misinterpreting the world around them, So, and that applies to uh, actions of others. Um, in many cases, kids will um, interpret very benign surroundings, benign facial expressions, for example, as being hostile or dangerous. Uh, and there's even some, some research to, to uh, suggest that kids who've been physically abused uh, are more likely to interpret a very neutral facial expression as something that is dangerous or hostile. Uh, and so with that kind of misinterpretation, uh, their behaviors are going to be out of place uh, and surprising to people because they're interpreting it in a different way than everybody else is interpreting it. Uh, and that can be very difficult for the people around them, foster parents, biologic parents, to figure out what to do. I know, Judge Walker, one of the comments you made um, in some of our, our work sessions in preparing for this is that it's very important to take a, a moment to stop yes. and think, and why is this child doing it, rather than just reacting. Can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Well, I just want to give you an example from my courtroom that really got my attention. I had a young man that was coming back to court repeatedly for technical violations of his probation. It was little things of not reporting, not calling in, nothing that would be significant as far as behavior. Uh, but he was there week after week after week and, and, and I was puzzled and I said, I know that you're trying to tell me something. And I just stopped and I, I pushed back and said, but I need to think. And when I was able to step back and, and just spend some minutes working through the behavior, and thinking, why does he need to be in front of me? What is it he wants me to know? And in that time of reflection, I'm able to look beyond him, look at his mother, and realize that she's back on methamphetamines. She's moving and twitching and all of the things that you see people do with their mouth. And then I know he doesn't have the ability to tell me, I want help. I want my mother to get help. He was wanting me to see it. And because I was focusing on his behavior, I wasn't seeing that it was a family issue. So I think it's very important for our foster parents, our caseworkers, our judges, is when we see behavior, we need to sort of step back and look at the big picture so that we understand what that person is conveying to us with the behavior. Because that young man loved his mother and he wanted her to be safe. He wanted her to have help but he didn't want to be the one that say she's using again. I think it's um, such a great point and it makes me want to circle back to your quote from earlier along with what you just said Dr. Greenbaum and that's when children don't have language their behavior becomes their language and that that behavior serves as a function for mm -hmm. something. Mm -hmm. And so when you take that in its whole context I think um, that step back becomes so critical. And, and I know the other thing that happens, um, we had an example of a child who had come into care who the foster family initially had, had a, just a terrible time trying to get her to uh, just walk into a bathroom. Um, bath time was, was, an, uh, was a nightmare. She refused to get in a bathtub. And you know they, they took that step back they did a little investigating, figured out what had happened earlier in her life, and it turns out that she was put in scalding water as a form of punishment for her behavior. So of course the bathroom was a terrifying place to this little girl. So 
Dr. Greenbaum, can you talk for a second about fear conditioning and what we might see in children, how that might manifest itself, particularly for folks who are on the front lines working with them? Yeah, I think this is so important, important for all of us who interact with children. So children who have been um, traumatized in the way that, let's just take your example, a child who's been scalded as a form of punishment, um, that extreme fear and, and anxiety uh, becomes associated not only with the scalding water, but with all the uh, sort of neutral stimuli around it. Being in the bathroom, for example, uh, or being a certain time time of night, uh, if it always happens at 7 o'clock, or it always happens after dinner, it always happens in that bathroom, then these neutral stimuli of bathroom, dinner, 7 o'clock, become associated with this trauma. Uh, and so that can be generalized. So now the child doesn't want to go in any bathroom. Now the child gets anxious at 7 o'clock no matter where they are. Uh, and it can be very debilitating for the child. It, we call these trigger events. Uh, and one of the things that foster parents can get really good at is to try to figure out what is that trigger event. So when the child starts screaming like that, it'd be great for the foster parent to sit back and say, okay, clearly that was a trigger event. What just happened? Maybe it's the bathroom, is it the bathroom? Is it seven o'clock, what is this? Uh, and if the child's old enough, try to start processing it with them so that eventually the child can help out. Now this child's too young to do that. But um, the more that we as frontline providers can understand that behavior, step back and say, okay, what's the function for that? The function for that, for that child was to survive. Uh, we can say this is a trigger, the behavior is serving a function, what is that function and how can I eliminate these triggers? And, and eventually, when the child's old enough, how can we help the child to deal with those triggers themselves? So one of the things that I think has been difficult for adults to really wrap their heads around is that our youngest kids can have mental health needs. Mm -hmm. Yes. We don't want to think that, right? We want to think that children can bounce back from anything, that they can just be happy, um, they're little kids. And, and what we know because of brain science is that's, that's not always the case. And one of the things that recently just happened, um, and I want to give a, a woohoo moment, <laughs> is that our governor has allotted 2.5 million to bring mental health services to children under five. This is the first time our state has really done this and looked at this. Um, and it's, it is definitely a, a, a yay moment um, for what's happening here. Um, in Georgia, but I do think it's important for everyone to be able to talk openly about the stigma that can be associated with asking for mental health needs. And one of the things that I always find interesting is that, you know, the heart is an organ. If we're having problems with our heart, we think nothing about going to see a specialist for that, but the brain is also an organ. And if it's not functioning properly, we somehow think we're all supposed to figure that out on our own. So can you talk a little bit about the stigma you may have seen in your respective areas and how we begin to have a better dialogue about mental health needs? Whoever wants to start can jump in. Uh, well, for us in the court system, we talk about the social emotional needs as opposed to talking about it in terms of mental health. And we also have to stop using mental health and mental illness interchangeably because they are very different terms. When we do the work that we're talking about here with brain development, we are planting seeds for mental health. When we don't have that strong bond, that secure bond, that attachment, we've planted the seeds for mental illness that will manifest when that child reaches adolescence or early adulthood. So it's very, very important for us to work hard in doing the social-emotional components of growth and development so that children have the ability to be mentally healthy as adolescents and as adults. And if we take the stigma away by saying we are doing things that are building mental health in our children, then I don't think that's stigmatizing. I'd like to bring in something from my previous life um, because in, as, as, a, as the Commissioner of Public Health, I really don't have an opportunity to see that stigma so much, but I certainly did in private practice. Um, and because you were a OBGYN. I, I was an OBGYN. Um, and, um, and I would see, as an OBGYN, you of course see children who are sexually abused. Um, you see families who are have domestic violence issues, you see lots and lots of problems. Um, and patients would come to me and they would have um, the most common one, for example, that would come to a GYN is I have abdominal pain. 
or you know, um, or I, you know, I'm having problems with my period. Um, and when you would do the all the appropriate workups, uh, the labs were good, the x-rays were fine, um, you might even do a laparoscope and look inside and indeed the, the biology was absolutely perfect from that point of view. So at that point the conversation in my office was handled, your mind and your body are not in separate places. What happens in your body is, is and you experience in your body, has to do with what happens in your brain. What happens in your brain has to do with what happens in your body. So if you begin to, to, to demonstrate to folks that there is a connection and it's, it's inalienable, you can't have it separately, then I think that that notion that, you know, this is something that is real, not just something that I'm supposed to handle by myself or is made up, that seemed to help with my patients. Is there anything you want to add? Um, just a little bit. There's a move now um, within the medical field, but within all um, areas of treating children, uh, the trauma-informed approach in which we really recognize that trauma has an impact on a child or a person's health uh, and their beliefs and their behaviors, and that we really have to have a paradigm shift. Uh, and it, it, instead of see, asking, what, what's wrong with you? like we ask as doctors, what's wrong with you? Um, we have to say, what happened to you? And it, say, trauma happened to you, but you can get beyond that. It's not who you are. You can get beyond that uh, and move on. And it, is not, uh, a, it does not stigmatize you as somebody who is now um, somehow at fault or tarnished. I think the other piece of the, the mental health puzzle that we need to address, particularly for the benefit of our children, is maternal depression mm, yes. and how we identify that early and how we get resources to that mom because that in particular can lead to a lot of neglect and I don't know if any of you are doing anything specifically to address that but there is a ton of stigma mm -hmm. attached to being able to say you know I, I was depressed yeah I think you're right. Right. Uh, you know, I had postpartum depression for the first three months after yeah. my first child. Right. But I was in a loving, supportive environment that, you know, and my mother had it, so we could talk about it. Right. A lot of moms don't have that and don't know how to get through that. Right. Or don't even recognize what's happening. Mm -hmm. But we routinely, if we're dealing with someone who's had a child, we routinely know to scream for that. And one of the things around the work in neglect is that it's important for us to go beyond the surface of neglect. Many times when we do the work, we discover that there are issues around substance abuse. There are also issues with regard to depression. So it's very important to go beyond the surface and ask the questions. When we, we can't just say that it's neglect and go from there, it helps to ask all of the questions. And by all the questions, I mean we screen for substance abuse, we screen for mental illness, and when we've got trust, and rapport, we ask about safety in the home. Domestic violence and any kind of sexual violence is not likely to come out until there's a trust relationship. So we can't just take our cases at surface value for the first thing we see. We have to delve into the family dynamics and make sure that we address all the issues. If we miss something, these families are likely to come back or it takes longer to reunify. But if we identify everything up front, then we're much more focused on what we have to do to make this family strong enough to be able to parent these children safely. And home visitation, I'm assuming, addresses this issue as well. Yes, home visitation, um, but, but you're absolutely right. And I believe in the state that it's a, it is a need that we really need more concentration on and more resources. Um, because um, when you are a, a depressed person, uh, it, is, it is the epitome of the still face. Uh, you know, you're not reacting to the, to the child. Um, and, um, and you were talking about postpartum depression. Um, pregnancy is a tremendous uh, <laughs> burden on a body. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that goes on. And quite frankly, it's exhausting. Uh, 
Um, to carry around, you know, 30 to 50 more pounds every single day. And oh, by the way, as soon as you get rid of those 30 to 50 pounds, or, you know, 25, or actually eight, <laughs> you have to deal with this infant constantly. That's exhausting. Um, so you're right, the whole importance of, and that's what, you know, like I was talking about at DeKalb, it's so important. Those women there, those, that MORE program, they said, whatever that person needs, we'll give them. That supportive structure is the, is the way to deal with that environment. Well, I know we are coming close to the end of our time, so I'm going to give each of you the opportunity, because you've got this great audience out there listening. What's the one takeaway you would like for this audience to have when we talk about um, child abuse, neglect, brain science? What, what's the one thing you would like for them to leave knowing today? And I'll start with you, Dr. Greenbaum. I think for me the most important point is that there is hope that uh, even if children have a really rough start uh, and their attachment relationships are not good early on, this does not mean they are destined to a life of hell, really. I mean, they, there are options, um, supportive environments, supportive relationships, very supportive foster parents, therapies can be uh, really life-changing. And so I think there is hope and we have to concentrate on that. Not only minimize the problems that occur early on, but say, for those kids who do get traumatized, what are we going to do about it? Uh, and uh, concentrate on you know, prevention and then early intervention. And what I want to say is that this group is the group that will be seeing these children early. So what I want the take home message to be, the earlier the better. It certainly is always better to prevent than to try to recuperate. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you see something and you're, you're a little bit suspicious, uh, I don't want the, the message to be, oh, I think I'll just watch this a little more. I want there to be a deliberate approach, and a, 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 an, agree, an increased awareness, and a cre an increased evaluation of that situation so that you act as quickly as possible. The first relationship and the caretaking relationship for an infant and a toddler are critical to their outcomes for the rest of their life. If they are going to be able to learn, if they're going to be able to have healthy relationships, if they're going to be able to control their emotions, control their behavior, they have to have a loving, nurturing relationship with an appropriate adult. Well, I think um, this has been really a fascinating discussion that we could continue to have for several more hours, but we did want to take a moment to open it up to any questions that might be out there um, for the panel. So one of the first things that popped up was we um, saw a comment from someone that um, their takeaway was that every new mom or dad doesn't instinctively know how to interact with their with their newborn. And I think that is, that's one of, we, we were all going, yay, that's one of the best takeaways. Um, because, you know, you think about every other skill that we have, whether it's driving a car, driving a boat, or whatever, you have to go and learn. Parenting is the one thing we're not required to learn. And it is a skill to be a good parent. So there is no shame in learning how to be a good parent getting those resources, reading books, going to Cox campus, um, whatever that may be, but I, I think that that's a, it's also a freeing statement for a parent to know, I don't know how to do this perfectly and that's okay. And I should be learning. Um, so I that think really that's should, a great one. That really should be a message from all the professionals who are working with parents, from the pediatricians, from the public health nurses, everybody should be pushing that. And you don't have to know, it's okay not to know. There's no stigma. Um, one of the other ones is, um, uh, uh, and I don't know if this was a foster mom who was saying this, but that, that initial relationship is so vital, um, that primary attachment piece. And I think one of the things that many folks out there in this audience are seeing are primary attachment issues because um, those children have been so disrupted with their placements, with their, um, their birth parents, with their, and, and the importance of recognizing that is critical. Um, I'd like to answer the question that one of the CASAs has raised about resources and about getting services. What I encourage uh, 
everyone who has cases that are coming through the court system is to have that initial referral made to Children's First so that we can have the Babies Can't Wait evaluations done and to determine what services should come through Part C. When a child reaches 36 months and they're not eligible for services through public health, then we need to be asking the special education coordinators in the local school system to have that child evaluated. Those children will often qualify for Head Start or Early Head Start, and the sooner we address the issues and problems for our children, the better the outcomes. So there are services for children under the age of four, and they're housed typically in public health or in the school system in early special education. Can I make a point about assessment? I think it's really important, I think we've talked about this a little bit, to get that comprehensive early assessment to figure out exactly what the limitations are the, or the quote problem behaviors are for a child and then to look at it through a trauma lens and say, well, is this uh, related to trauma? And if so, how can I go about treating it? Because it might be different for a child who's been traumatized and for a child who's been um, has developmental issues for other other reasons. So I think having a very comprehensive assessment early on to figure out exactly what needs treated treatment and then look at it through a trauma lens is important. So there was also a question um, from someone saying that they were told that they couldn't get services for children four and under and, and the good news is is that is one of the very specific things we addressed with the state um, and that's one of the things that the governor is responding to is making those services available for children under the age of five now this just happened, so it's going to take a little while for this to filter out into um, the community, but they are opening that up so that there will be resources available for, um, for this population. So that should begin to, to change. And the other question I saw was around corporal punishment mm. and um, uh, families mm. using corporal punishment um, that kind of cross the line. and she, this person wanted to know if there was research out there. There is a great deal of research um, about the effects of corporal punishment, none of which are positive, by the way. Um, and we could provide some links afterwards to that research, because that may help that parent understand yeah. what the long-term effects of corporal punishment are, unless you know a specific uh, I'm just trying to think of where you can go, child. Um, now, let me get the resources for you. Okay, the child and we'll provide them. We'll yeah, there because there is a lot of research done on that. I just saw a question about um, the takeaway. She says, I have a law degree and the talk to your baby is huge. She said, I have three children and uh, remember the awkwardness uh, and it feels, you know, I got more comfortable with every child. And that's what's interesting. The, what struck me about that is if you have a law degree or if you cannot read, your ability to talk to your baby is exactly the same. Um, so I think that is very empowering for parents to know. Um, and there are lots of resources available. Um, and in one of our films that we have that is running in public health clinics um, is we have a whole session on, you know, taking your baby to the library and all that kind of stuff and reading to your baby. But there's a very clear message in there, two very clear messages that I want to say here. One is if you cannot read, pointing out the pictures, pointing out the colors, talking to your baby will do the same thing. And the second part is um, because often we have, especially we have a lot of primary Spanish speakers in Georgia, talk in your primary language. Um, that that has been shown uh, through the studies that talking in your primary language does more to develop the brain and then when the need for English has become is when the need for English is there like when the child in school that child can learn English quicker because that brain has been developed with the primary language I think one of the other things is that people think that maybe they have to talk in a specific way to a baby or and, and I often use the example of when my oldest, I would put him in one of those jumpy things when I was getting ready, and I would literally talk to him about the makeup I was putting on. And I would let him see the lipstick, or because it's what I was doing at that moment. And the truth is, you know, he found it interesting. You know, it was something new. I often laugh that he grew up and wore makeup. I would know why. <laughs> he grew up and loves girls. Um, but the point being is that Really, they just want to know what's going on in the world around yes. them. So if you're grocery shopping, you can point out 
you know, the, bana the yellow banana. If right. you're in the car, you can point out things through the window. It really is just about talking to them about the world that's around them. And that's something we all can do. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't have to be anything fancy or special. Right. They just want to talk to you. They just want to talk to you and serve in return, the right. back and forth. And, and that's an important piece as well because, you know, when that baby babbles to you and you say, really, gosh, that's really interesting, and they babble back, that piece is what's absolutely critical, and that's what part of um, Hart and Risley's study showed is that that actual, when the baby actually returns back, it's not just about serving to the baby. It's about waiting for that child to respond, and then having that exchange is really critical. Um, and I think that part is sometimes in our rush. We don't wait for them to babble back. Right. But they're actually saying something to mm -hmm. us. Uh, that reminds me. We have a put another video that I didn't bring in, and that discussion reminds me, there's another video. When we were putting together all the resources for the Talk With Me Baby, we found this online, and it's a parent, I think the parent was in Australia, and we call it the dancing baby. This baby is so little, I mean, this baby is not sitting up yet, and the dad goes, hey, how are you, and goes, da 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 and points at the baby, and the baby goes, ha, ha, <laughs> and then stops, and the dad goes, da, 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 and the baby goes, ha, 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 ha. it's fascinating that the baby stops and watches the dad, and when the dad stops, the baby responds. It's absolutely fascinating. We'll get that for you. That ought to be a resource. Yeah. So that just that illustrates the importance, and the, the I think that's another way to demonstrate that early brain development that's occurring. And this this baby was probably three months old. There was a question about the services being reimbursable through Amerigroup. The answer to that question is yes. We are working on making certain that the therapies offered would be billable under Medicaid. Uh, we have been doing it in Douglas County, and we are a pilot site to make sure that we get all of those uh, codes set up so that it is possible to have services provided through Medicaid. Um, one of the last things I just saw was someone who works with teens. I just saw that too. Um, yeah. And it's interesting because uh, a couple of years ago I got asked to come and speak to a group of freshmen. Um, and uh, I decided to talk to them about brain development. And what I didn't know at the time is that half of these ninth graders, these are 14 year olds, had either been pregnant were currently pregnant or had fathered a child, literally half of the class. Um, and we talked about brain development and what is actually happening in a young child. And it was really interesting because it was a kind of a gateway to talk about safe sex, why we need to, what's happening in a teenager's brain, right, that, that gets them kind of, you know, that they're doing crazy things, but that's because their teenage brain's telling them to. But also, we talked about if they, if they were gonna have a baby, how to have a really smart baby. And the reason I'm bringing this up is um, she said that they have a lot of teens in juvenile court that are, due, uh, that are there due to trauma in early childhood. I think when you talk about brain development, when you talk about the science of it, it helps to remove some of the stigma. This is all about science. Right. And, and when you can talk about it that way to teenagers, they actually find it really interesting and um, it was amazing, at the end of the class, I had put together these pamphlets for all the kids, and I thought, none of them will take it. Every one of them got taken, and I had kids coming up to me afterwards saying, how can I learn more about this? So, you know, when you talk about science, when it's not judgmental, when there's not this um, uh, kind of value placed on it, uh, kids, do, kids do listen, particularly teenagers, because they're curious. I think another thing about uh, I, that caught my eye too, her comment, um, is that there's a lot of brain development going on during the teenage years. And right. we tend to focus on the early years and thinking, well, that's when all the brain development, but that's not true. It goes on and on. And the teens actually have a very important period of brain development as well. It's fascinating. Uh, and I think uh, you make a very good point, Stephanie, that it, it really helps explain some of their behavior. Well, the, it's important the, to know what's going on and why they do what they do. The risk reward factor in a teenage brain is the highest it yeah. will ever be at any point yeah. in its life. And so, 
they may think it's the coolest idea in the world to try and jump off that balcony into the pool to impress the girlfriend because the, the, the reward of looking cool outweighs the risk. For our kids that have had abuse, neglect, these issues within their family life, their executive functioning skills are impaired. So their ability to make great decisions for themselves are already compromised. And when you add in the teenage brain risk reward, they can really make some dangerous choices for themselves, which is why this population has some of the worst outcomes. We have an 11% graduation rate of our foster youth in this state. Um, part of that is, is because when they get to this age, they aren't making great choices, and we've really got to wrap ourselves around them at that point as well. So you're right, Jordan. Teenage years are, are critical on the other side of this. Yeah. One of the reasons that we see education as an issue is if you have had to spend every ounce of your energy on surviving, then you can't really concentrate on learning. So we anticipate that our children are going to have educational needs and that we need to enrich their environment and support them with their educational needs. Uh, the rate for some type of developmental delay is four to five times greater than in the general population. So I think that if we understand to expect that and make sure we're doing the assessments and then doing the services that support that child, we can get those educational outcomes to be much better if we understand that because they've experienced trauma, they will have an impact on their learning. One of the last co uh, comments was, I was not able to copy all this down. Don't worry. <laughs> we can, th this, is, this is being recorded. We've got slides to email out. We've got um, video links to send. Um, the good news is there is so much great information out there today. Um, and we will make sure that everyone gets all of that as well. The Child Welfare Training Collaborative, I wanted to make certain that we talk about that. We have a Center for Excellence where we're actually able to work on training for all the stakeholders so that we are approaching our children and families from the same perspective so that we all understand and we go beyond trauma-informed. Our next step is to become trauma responsive. And with the Child Welfare, Welfare Training Collaborative, our, our brain development uh, 101 and 201, we also have the, um, uh, what's uh, the? Trauma 101. Trauma 101, 101 and 201. 201. And then we'll be having the capstone courses, which tells us how we use science to serve our children and families. Well, I just, I wanted to take a moment to thank everybody out there in the audience for the work that they do, because they're really the ones on the front line, um, and, and it's, it's, it's really God's work that they're doing, and, and it's not unappreciated. I know it doesn't get talked about enough, but we were so thankful that people